Now I'll start the recording and I will say hello and welcome to Ritmo, well at least in a virtual uh, version. Uh, this is uh, as the Ritmo seminar, it's part of the Ritmo seminar series and it's also part of the annual Ritmo Largo that we, um, that we should hold every year. Uh, of course this year is different um, because uh, we are only present uh, through, through Zoom. But still, um, we are very happy to, to have this seminar uh, today with uh, Rebecca Fierbrink, um, who's a reader from the Creative Computing Institute at University of the Arts London. It's very nice to have you with us, Rebecca. Um, and uh, it's, uh, Rebecca is very well known for um, uh, the Wekinator, among many other things, and I'm sure she will talk about that. Um, personally, I also know Rebecca, we met at McGill University um, quite a long time ago now. Yeah. Uh, you oh. were doing your master's there and I was there as a visiting researcher. Uh, then you moved on to, to Princeton where you did a PhD and also joined the faculty. And then you moved on to Goldsmiths in London and now then to University of the Arts. And we're also very happy to have you on board of our scientific advisory board here at, at RITMO. Um, in addition to you, um, I'm also joined by Kiri Glette, who's an associate professor here at RITMO, um, and Benedicte Wallace, who's a PhD fellow here at RITMO, and um, they will then um, join us in, in a panel discussion uh, after, after Rebecca's talk. Uh, I should perhaps have said also that I'm Alexander Jensenius, I'm a deputy director here at, at RITMO, uh, and also professor of music technology here at the University of, of Oslo. Um, uh, to those that um, came in now, um, I should also say that we are now in a Zoom webinar, which behaves a little bit differently than a Zoom meeting. So if you see at the bottom of your screen, you have some normal Zoom things, um, including the chat where you can say hello and, and other things. And we also have a separate Q&A. So if you want to ask questions, and you're very welcome to ask questions, um, then uh, you can ask those in the Q&A part here. And uh, we'll get back to those after um, Rebecca's, Rebecca's talk. We also record uh, the session and we'll make that available uh, as well uh, afterwards. I should also say that if you're interested in Ritmo and Ritmo's activities, then you can also sign up for the Ritmo inf info mailing list where you can get information about activities here. So that's uh, that you can find on the Ritmo uh, web page. But then I think that's enough for the introduction. Um, and then I would like to give the the word to Rebecca. Thank you so much, Alexander. Um, and thank you to Ritmo for having me here today. Um, hopefully another time I can come see you in person. Um, today I'm gonna to be talking about machine learning as meta instrument. And I'll get to what that means in a bit. Um, but I'm gonna to start today with uh, a, an introduction to machine learning basics. I think most people here know at least a little bit about machine learning. A number of you are experts, but I'm not gonna assume any particular background knowledge. So we'll start to, with an introduction to that. And then I'll talk about my research and, and some of my favorite research done by others and talking about uh, creative interactions with machine learning as well as creating interactions with machine learning. So let's get started um, talking about what machine learning is. And I think um, it's, it's really helpful when thinking about the creative possibilities of machine learning to you know, forget the sort of science fiction conceptualizations of, of AI as an agent or another intelligence, and really just thinking about machine learning as a set of tools for finding patterns in data. Um, and of course, the way this is often taught in a conventional computer science context um, is geared towards not necessarily creative applications, but more mundane applications. So for instance, let's imagine that you own a web shop, you're selling music online, and you have uh, data collected from many of your customers in your online shop. Uh, you have demographic information, maybe information about what websites they've visited in the past. Um, you could use machine learning to uh, discover that you have sets of um, similar customers, maybe clusters or groups that you might want to market to uh, in particular ways. You might also collect data, of course, about what these customers buy or listen to on your website. And perhaps you see that these customers on the left listen to one album and the customers on the right listen to another. Um, this can help you to make predictions. When you see a new customer, you know maybe a little bit about them because you've got you know tracking from where they've been on the web. Uh, and you can look at this customer and say, you know what, they're very likely to enjoy this music, so I'm going to highlight to that that to them when they arrive in my shop right so very mundane uses of machine learning 
Of course, oftentimes now when people think about creative uses of machine learning, their mind immediately jumps to generative machine learning, um, which doesn't have exactly the same kind of uses in commerce that we've been talking about for the last few decades. Instead, generative machine learning still uses patterns, but it uses these patterns to generate new content that is similar but not identical to content in an existing corpus. So we could do this now. That's not so interesting to do if we think of these uh, as customers, but if we just think of them as images of cats, we could train a generative algorithm on thousands of images of cats and generate new pictures of cats in case we were worried that the internet was going to run out of pictures of cats. Um, and of course, you've probably seen um, some of the really interesting projects using these types of generative algorithms in the last few years to generate music, to generate art. Um, one very notable example is this piece called Portrait of Edmund Bellamy, which was created by uh, Again in 2018 and sold for a ridiculous amount of money at a Christie's auction. Um, if you're paying attention to the music AI space, you may have noticed this OpenAI jukebox project, with, which came out in April this year. Um, this is kind of, in some ways, the musical equivalent of this portrait of Edwin, Edmund Bellamy uh, approach to machine learning. You train this on lots and lots and lots of examples of music, and it's capable of generating new music. Um, and there's some really fun technical details in there, which you can go read about online. But for now, I'm just going to play you one of my favorite excerpts of this. This is Hot Tub Christmas, um, a style, a, a piece written in the style of Frank Sinatra, sung in the style of Frank Sinatra, but of course not a song that Frank Sinatra ever wrote or sang. Oh, we can't hear that sound, Rebecca. You can't hear it. Interesting. Um, I'm going to turn off when you tested. <laughs> yeah, I'm going to turn off sharing of my sound and turn it back on and see. Are you yes. able to hear this now? Yeah? Yes. Great. Let's let's go just play a little bit of this again from the beginning because it's pretty funny here. It's Christmas time and you know what that means. Oh, it's hot tub time, as I like the tree this year, will be a time. All right, the whole thing is on the internet if you really need to hear more. Oops, there we go. So um, often, especially in the last couple of years, when I get asked questions about how machine learning is impacting human creativity, what the future looks like, I get asked some questions that actually make me pretty sad. So over and over again, I get asked, you know, but are machines really capable of being creative or are machines capable of making real art? Um, and, you know, this question's a bit problematic because it, that all depends on your definition of creativity or art. Um, and it's, you know, <laughs> not something that I'm deeply worried about. It's not the most interesting question I can think of to ask. Um, or people ask, well, isn't it terrible there are gonna be no more jobs for creative people because we're just gonna you know, put hot tub time machine on the radio and nothing else from now until the end of the human race. And I don't think that that's really likely. In fact, I think there's, again, more interesting questions we can ask, more interesting things we can do with machine learning. Uh, because if there's a mode of supporting human creativity at all in these generative methods that, you know, I've been talking about, it kind of looks like this one, right? Microsoft Clippy asking, hey, it looks like you're trying to generate some art. Do you want me to do it for you? Right. And of course, um, most humans are not particularly interested in this as creators. Um, sure, we might be able to generate some content that people enjoy or find useful, um, but that's really not the limit of human creativity. Um, so some of the questions that I think are more interesting, which I focus on in my work, are these. How might people use machine learning within their existing creative practices? Um, as well as how might machine learning expand people's creative capabilities, whether we're talking about musicians or artists or other people, whether we're talking about novices, experts, students, and so on. So if we're interested in these questions, we can go back to that definition of machine learning that I gave you um, and break it down a bit and say, well, when and why might it be creatively useful to find patterns, to make predictions, or to generate new data? Um, and of course, I'm interested in 
making this practically possible. I like building tools. And so I'm interested in how, I, how might we structure interactions between people and algorithms in order for these approaches to be useful, to be usable. How can we create or enable creators to use machine learning effectively? All right, so one way into answering these questions is to think about what types of data are useful or interesting in different types of creative practice. And when you start looking for such data, you find out that it's, it's basically everywhere, right? And creators can benefit in many ways when they're able to work more effectively with such data. Right? So data that we might be interested in in art or music isn't just existing images or existing sounds. Um, it might be data about how people interact with existing collections of images or sounds. It might be data um, about how expert editors work with Photoshop or digital audio workstations. Um, it could be data about how artists and musicians or dancers move their bodies, um, information about sound or images uh, captured from the world, in data from social media, right? All of these have potentially very interesting uh, artistic applications. Um, and of course, you know, many of these types of data are increasingly easy for us to capture. When I began this research in 2008, I was working with musicians who were interested in specifically building new musical instruments and other performance interfaces with such data. Um, they were using sensors like the ones you see on the screen to capture information about how performers move their bodies, and then they were writing software to translate these movements or actions into sound. Uh, soon after, I noticed that people in other fields were tackling essentially the same type of engineering problems, right? A dancer might want to capture and track her movements, for example, to coordinate lighting or other effects. Um, a game designer might want to use physical actions of players rather than simple button presses to control gameplay. Um, and of course, increasingly, the devices that we have our at our disposal to capture this data are becoming easier to use, they're becoming cheaper. Um, However, if you've ever tried to build a performative interface with this kind of data, you know that interpreting this data or mapping it to meaningful control over sound or image or some other process can be really difficult and really annoying, even if you have deep expertise in programming and signal processing. So fortunately, we can use the same kind of predictive machine learning infrastructure that's used to make product recommendations and instead use it to create interactions with computers. And this is the beginning of my, my PhD work was really making this connection and then exploring how we might, uh, how we might exploit it. Um, so for instance, instead of saying, well, here's some data about a customer, let's predict what kind of music they want, might want to purchase. We could say, well, here's some data about how a musical performer is moving and let's predict what kind of sound they want a computer to make in a, a musical instrument that they're controlling in real time. Or maybe here's data in the form of audio captured from a, a, an acoustic musician. Let's predict or decide what kind of live visuals we want to have generated in real time in response to that music. Um, and of course, this is very useful outside of music as well. We might have somebody um, speaking or making sounds or movements into a game engine and we want to have our game character take some action as a result. So surprisingly, when I began this work in about 2008, um, I didn't see many musicians, artists, or other creators making use of these algorithms. Um, and in part, this is because the software tools that were out there were tailored more for tasks like product recommendation and less for real-time creative work. So I became really interested in how we could support musicians, artists, and other creative people to use these algorithms in their work. And I was curious about what might happen if we, if we did support them in better ways. So I built a piece of software called Wekinator. Um, some of you might be familiar with this. Um, the, idea was that you could use machine learning to build the kinds of systems that you see on the screen. You have some kind of data coming in. It could be from a camera or audio or sensors or something else. Um, this data gets sent to a machine learning model for prediction using the same kind of predictive algorithms that you might use in product recommendation, i.e. supervised learning for those of you who know about machine learning. And then out of this model, we get some values that we can use to control sound, animation, and games, and so on. And the idea was that you could build these kinds of models um, without having to be a programmer, without having to know much about machine learning. Um, and Wekinator, of course, allows you not only to run these in real-time systems, but actually to build these models from scratch. 
Um, and of course, one of, one of the great benefits of machine learning is that you don't have to have someone who's an expert programmer writing the code for this predictive module in um, an instrument or a game or, or other piece of, of software. Um, instead, what you have is a machine learning algorithm that builds this model or this function for prediction from a set of examples. So if I were building this sort of hand-controlled musical instrument, I could give it examples of my hand um, paired with a sound that I might want to hear when I have my hand in that position, and then maybe examples of my hand doing something else with a different sound. Um, and then if all goes well, I'll have this model that I can show new hand positions to, and it will hopefully give me reasonable control over sound. Um, one of the, the interesting things that Wekinator allows you to do, which is different from a lot of more conventional machine learning software tools, is that um, if you build this model and you wanna change it for some reason, right, because it doesn't make some mistake on some types of hand gestures, or just because you maybe wanna have it make different sounds for all sorts of other reasons, um, you can go back and change the training data, right? You can change the training examples, use that algorithm to build uh, another model, and then use that model uh, in performance or in prototyping where you explore it further and decide whether you wanna change the data yet again. And so this, this sort of iterative interactive approach of building, you know, starting with creating some training examples, giving those to your algorithm, testing out a model and seeing whether you're happy with it or seeing what you might want to change about it and then going back and changing the training data. Um, this is called interactive machine learning in the human computer interaction domain. And it turns out this is really key to what made Wekinator a useful tool and, and uh, has changed the way that I think about how we should be using machine learning for creative practice and what the creative possibilities are in this space. So um, when I'm doing an in-person talk at this point, usually I do a live demo. Um, that doesn't work so well over Zoom, so I'm gonna give you a demo video that I recorded um, that shows you essentially the same thing. So let's dive into that. And Alexander can let me know if the sound doesn't work here. All right, in this demo, I'm going to build a very simple gesture-controlled drum machine using Wekinator. Um, and uh, as my input device to capture information about gesture, I'm going to use my webcam. Um, and I've got a little program here, which I like to call the world's worst computer vision feature extractor. Um, what I'm doing is just taking those pixels coming in from the webcam and downsampling that to a 10 by 10 views. Um, and this gives me 100 numbers. And you know these numbers are going to change as I move in front of the camera, as you see. Um, but even if you're an amazing programmer, I would guess that you would not want the oops the job of writing the program that looks at these 100 values right. and says something useful about what I am doing in front of the camera. So instead, we're going to use machine learning to make sense of these 100 values um, and make pretty accurate predictions about what kinds of gestures or motions I'm doing. All right, so I'm going to have Wekinator here listen to 100 values from this camera program, and I'm going to build a classifier, which is going to, again, predict what type of action am I doing at the moment. And uh, we're not going to load a training set from somewhere else. We're actually going to build this training set uh, right from scratch in the demo. And I want to, you know, not just have Wekinator output a number, I want to have this control the sound and make this a little bit fun, right? We're going to control a drum machine, like I said. So I'm going to run a very simple drum machine program written in Chuck. And when I send this drum machine different numbers, we're going to hear different sounds, just like this. All right, so let's start out. Let's give it some training examples. And I'm going to say that when I am right here in front of the camera, I want to hear this simple sound. So I've got 17 snapshots of me here paired with the sound. And next, I'm going to tell that when I'm not in front of the camera, turn that down so you can hear, when I'm not in front of the camera, when I'm out of frame, I want to play a different sound, specifically this one. Let's go. OK, now I've trained. I've built my model. Let's run this model and see what happens. Okay, it's pretty good. It's definitely um, changing between the two sounds, more or less the way I'd like it to. 
However, it's being a little bit too eager to change to that second sound, even when I'm not totally out of frame yet. So I'm going to give it some more training examples to try to fix that error and say that when I'm right here, actually, I still want to hear the first sound. And now I'll retrain, I'll rebuild that model and we'll see if it works any better. And in fact, that's pretty good. Um, I can keep moving around and see if I can make it make other mistakes like right here. I can, oops, forget I did that. Let's give this as sound one and say that I want sound one over here. And I can retrain and keep running and see that yes, it's doing what I'd like. And once I'm happy with that, maybe I want to make it more complicated. Um, I could give it another sound with, say, my hand in front of the camera, like this. Okay, there we go. That is a pretty easy way of using Weconator to make a classifier where I'm controlling um, a few different sounds based on simple movements of my body. All right, so that demo I just showed you uh, was pretty fun. Uh, you can imagine that you know, for an audience, watching somebody move on the stage is probably more interesting than watching them just change sound by clicking a mouse button. Um, and in the hands of a good choreographer, you can imagine something that becomes really visually compelling as well as, as sonically interesting. Um, but when professional composers have used Weconator, they're using it in a slightly different way. Often to um, exploit the fact that you can use machine learning to build very different types of instruments. Uh, the sounds that you heard in the previous instrument were the same sounds that I could easily make by just pressing a few buttons to switch between different sound options. Um, but sound becomes a lot more fun to many electronic composers when you can explore a really big space of sounds, when you've got a large palette to draw from and you can come up with ways of playing sound um, that are much more nuanced, much more complex, more exciting than just, you know, switching between a few different presets. Uh, so in this demo, I'm going to show you how you can use Weconator with regression to do exactly that. Um, and the instrument we're going to play is going to control a sound synthesis algorithm called Blotar. And Blotar is fun because it has a lot of different sounds that it's capable of making. So here's just a, a few of the Blotar sounds. Okay, and for each of these sounds, I'm, I'm getting that sound by giving Blotar a different set of control parameters. Specifically, I'm changing nine of its control parameters. So you can think of each of those sounds as a point in a nine dimensional space. And I'm going to build a Blotar instrument where I control these sounds using this. Um, this is a game track controller from uh, a, an old PlayStation game called Real World Golf but we're just gonna use it as essentially a six axis joystick. I get X, Y, and length of each of these two strings that I pull out of the base here. Um, and so I'm gonna tell Weconator I want to take these six input values and use them to control those nine blowtar parameters. And I'm gonna use regression so I get smooth changes. Um, and of course, this is, again, something that would be really hard to do even um, for someone who's an expert programmer, because not only are you trying to find good positions in this nine-dimensional space, but you're trying to come up with a mapping function that says how the motions that somebody's doing here um, move you through that space in a way that's not only musically interesting, but maybe gesturally comfortable, where um, the, the gestural mapping might be easy to learn or easy to execute certain gestures that give you sonic gestures and so on. Um, so that's very hard to think about as a programmer. It's a complex function to write, um, but here we can do it pretty easily with machine learning. So I'm going to start out by finding a sound that I want to put in the blowtar. And maybe I want that sound and I'm just going to put it over here pretty comfortably. Record some examples and maybe another sound higher in pitch, say over here. You can record some examples here and just Training from these, you, you understand what's going to start happening.
Okay, so I've got smooth change and it's learned that lower pitch is over here, higher pitch is over here. Um, that's fine, not too interesting yet. Let's start to add more sounds in and see what happens. Put this sound over here. Should mention this is taking a little bit longer than usual to train because I'm running my video capture software at the same time. Okay, so hopefully you saw some interesting stuff happening there. Um, not only was it giving me access roughly to the sounds that I put in the training set and still having this behavior that when my hand was kind of back here, I was getting a low to high pitch relationship, um, but it was also giving me all sorts of other sounds as it, I moved you know, between these very, very different timbres, um, which I'd put in, in different parts of my gesture space. Uh, I was getting sounds that I didn't put in the training set that I have never heard before, even though I do this demo quite frequently. Um, and this means that I can start gesturally exploring the space of this synthesis algorithm. Um, and of course, I can use machine learning to refine this instrument or this mapping that I've created. Uh, if I like a sound somewhere, I say, oh, that's a really cool sound and I like it where it is. I can add more training examples of that pair to reinforce that behavior. Or if I don't like a sound somewhere, I say, oh, you know, that's silly, that's silent, or that's just really stupid sounding. I can put a different sound in that part of the gesture space and uh, retrain it and I'll get a different instrument. And I can keep refining my instrument in this way until I'm happy with it. Then I can save the whole thing and run it, um, the models as they are during performance. Or perhaps I could even um, write a piece, and I've done this a few times in the past, where a performer retrains the instrument on stage and the evolving relationship between sound and gestures is part of a piece. Um, but most composers don't do that. Most composers spend a fair amount of time refining the instrument until it's something that they're happy with, and then they move on and, and do other aspects of the work. All right, so let's go back to uh, the, the regular part of the talk now. Um, so I began building the first version of Wekinator um, in 2008. Um, I worked really closely at that point with a small group of composers doing a participatory design process. Um, but since then, I've worked with a variety of other people looking not just at how musicians might use this kind of thing, but artists, game designers, and others. Um, and in the last five years or so, I've had about uh, over 25,000 users uh, from around the world, uh, everybody from kids and students to professionals in various domains download the software and use it. Um, so in the next few minutes, I'm going to share some research highlights with you from my observations and interviews and, and close collaborative creative practice with uh, these people and touch on a few of these questions. So how can machine learning support and expand people's creative practices? What might creative human machine learning interactions look like? And what kinds of consequences do these interactions have for creative practice? I'll start with um, the first one, which is, you know, my, my goal in beginning this work in 2008 was to enable people to work more effectively with data, especially at that time, data from sensors and building new musical instruments. And um, happily, but maybe not so surprisingly, yes, machine learning was really useful for this. Um, there's been a bunch of really fantastic pieces um, and instruments that people have made. Uh, I will give you a few excerpts just to give you some flavor of what people have done uh, beyond the demos that I just showed you. Um, starting this with this one, this is from Anne Hagee, a piece called From the Waters, and this is one of the first pieces that anybody made with Wekinator. Um, this uses the same game controller that I showed you in the second demo, but making, I would say, much better music with it.
um, you can watch the whole video on Vimeo or YouTube. Um, I really love this piece, both because it just sounds fantastic, it's really exciting to play, um, but also because you know, the, the visual um, and physical aspects of the motion in the music really do seem to match the sounds that arise. And that's the sort of thing that, you know, if you've, if you've built um, a musical instrument yourself without this kind of machine learning, you know that that can be really hard to achieve, to think about, you know, how exactly you want somebody to move and how exactly you want the sound to unfold from that. And then thinking about as a programmer, um, how to tackle that. It's, it's very tough. Um, more recent example is some work by Letitia Tsunami. Um, this is an instrument that she has been continuing to work on since um, about eight years now. Um, this is called Spring Spire, and this is uh, an excerpt from her performance of this at NIME 2014. And so this instrument uh, is played by plucking or scratching or hitting three metal springs that are strung across this frame. Um, and at the end of each spring is an audio pickup, but you're not hearing the audio from the springs themselves. You're actually, she's using these pickups to get very fine grained data about how each spring is moving, um, extracting some audio features from that data, sending those to Wekinator, and then using outputs from several dozen continuous regression models in Wekinator to control uh, a fairly complex set of, of um, synthesis objects in Max. So here's an excerpt of her performance. And again, you can watch uh, that whole performance on YouTube. Uh, you can also read about it in the NIME paper that I just published with Letitia a couple months ago at NIME 2020. Um, I love a lot of things about this instrument as well. And, and one of the things that I especially, especially love is that she's making music here that you really couldn't make with any other interface, right? She's made an instrument um, that allows completely new musical possibilities. Um, as I mentioned, Wekinator has been used uh, not only by musicians, by, but by artists as well. Uh, one of my favorite art pieces is uh, this one featured in Motherboard a few years ago. This consists of a webcam that you wear on your head. Uh, Wekinator is used to identify whether there is a screen in your field of vision, a mobile phone, a TV, so on. If there's a screen, the glasses you wear turn opaque, so you're not allowed to, work, to look at screens when you wear this sort of experimental art piece. Um, another favorite is just a, a one-off project from a student in one of my workshops. This is HiBot from Carolyn Hermans, and this uses a leap motion sensor to um, look at where your hand is in space. Wekinator detects whether you are waving um, at this little robot. It's called HiBot, and HiBot waves back at you if you wave at it, and that's it. Um, there's a lot of other um, both really funny and, and more serious uses of Wekinator that you can find online. Everything from making a croissant espresso controller for Google Maps to take you to the country where the food you're eating um, comes from, um, to chicks on speed, using it in a foot controlled musical instrument, to a startup called Voclia that used Wekinator for prototyping for voice controlled um, music interfaces. So there's all sorts of other cool examples that you can find. But now let's jump into some of the findings that have come out of my research that I didn't expect to see, that I didn't set out to find, but really came through out of work with users over a long period of time. 
Um, so one of the most interesting things I've learned is about how using machine learning in this way changes how we might think about what machine learning is good for and how to use it effectively in creative practice. So if you're a computer scientist, you've taken a machine learning course in computer science, you're trained to think about data sort of as ground truth, as um, something that you collect from the world uh, where your goal as a machine learning practitioner is to create the best model of that data as you can. Uh, however, in Wekinator and in similar applications of machine learning, data isn't exactly a ground truth, or at least it doesn't have to be. Often data is a way for people to communicate their ideas and intentions to a computer, right? It's, if you think about Letitia's piece or Anne Heggie's piece with the, the game controllers, it's not like there's one true relationship between movement and sound that exists in the world um, that you, we have to model because we don't understand it and we can't you know, express it any other way. Um, rather, there are ideas, often fluid, dynamic, sometimes half-formed ideas um, in people's heads, in people's bodies, about how they want a computer to interact with them. And data is the way that they communicate that. Um, and this has some interesting knock-on effects. So for one thing, if we think about data and machine learning as a way of communicating with the computer about what we want, Turns out this is a way better approach than math and code if we're talking about communicating tacit knowledge or embodied practices, right? Um, it's very hard to describe in English, if that's your native language, or to describe in math or code how you might want to move or how you do move when you're playing a musical instrument or how the sound you make changes as you sing. Right? It's much easier for you to demonstrate that. And in fact, if you were communicating about that to another human, you would communicate that using a lot of demonstrations rather than by writing down mathematical equations. Um, so this turns out to be one, I think, of the main reasons that people have used Wekinator and then later on other tools that we've made in this vein to build things. Um, even when people building things have been expert programmers, um, they've commented uh, like this saying, I've never before been able to work with a musical interface that allowed me to really feel the music as I was playing it and developing it, right? Communicating through example data gives you a qualitatively different experience, puts you in a different frame of mind and a different set of working practices than if you're constantly trying to translate what you want into math. Um, another effect of um, using data as an interface to communicate what you want to a computer is that often this can allow creators to very quickly prototype and explore many ideas, often doing this much more quickly than by programming. Um, and of course, if you know anything about creative work or the study of creativity, you know that trying out an idea, actually manifesting that idea in the world is really important to developing your own thinking about it. Um, and then that in creative practice, often it's really important for us to explore lots of ideas um, to iteratively change our own minds about what we're making um, through experimentation until we end up with the final thing. Uh, and of course, we do this in programming all the time, but it can be really slow and it can be really error prone. Um, whereas with machine learning, if you remember the demos, once you've set up the thing that sends input data and the thing that receives data, actually making that mapping relationship between them can be very fast. You can make a new prototype of an interaction, a connection between those two in a few seconds. And if you don't like it, you can often change it in a few seconds rather than going back and, and reevaluating your whole code. Um, furthermore, and I think this is, this is, again, not something that I set out to find, but one of the most important outcomes um, of this work is that machine learning can open up new creative relationships between people and machines. Um, the way that I've been describing how people using Wekinator can employ these more embodied, um, more exploratory, faster ways of, of designing new instruments. Um, this implies, and I've seen in practice, that designing new interfaces can actually become um, an embodied playful activity. And it was this observation in the people first using prototypes of the Wekinator that led me to think of it not as a machine learning tool so much as a meta instrument, something that made the process of designing an instrument itself very uh, creative, very exploratory, very, you know, a, a, a place, um, a site for human expression um, in the design process, which is very different from the way that uh, many people had experienced designing these interfaces in code. Um, 
Letitia Tsunami, who made the spring spire that I mentioned before, um, she also talks about the effect that this approach to design had on her work and how this actually um, enables her to think a bit differently about her goals um, during the instrument creation process. So she's written, in a way, you don't want the instrument to perform like a well-trained animal circus. You kind of want it to be a little wild. You want to adapt to it somehow, like riding a bull. I think the machine learning allowed more of this fun of exploring instead of going, I have to have a result right away. This thing is going to do that and leaving it at that. And in fact, in the nine paper that I mentioned that I, I co-authored with Letitia this year, um, she's written in, in much more depth about how she has come up with her own, I would say, playing techniques for machine learning. So in the, the instrument building process, she has techniques for controlling the amount of unpredictability that she gets uh, from the machine. Because sometimes when she's creating, she wants to be in a sort of co-exploratory space where she's throwing out some ideas and the machine learning is, is you know, letting her ride the bull in a sense. But sometimes she does want more control or sometimes she wants to explore a more limited space of ideas and work in more subtle ways. And so in this paper, she talks about how she's designed ways of using machine learning um, to achieve these kinds of goals. Um, the last point I'll touch on is this one, which is that designing with data rather than programming uh, can enable more people to become creators. Uh, this is incredibly important, right? Um, one of the things that is I hugely value is making technology that not only helps experts, but actually helps people who aren't experts do creatively satisfying things, do maybe even creatively amazing things. Um, the students that you see here are a bunch of 15 year old high schoolers. Um, I did a workshop with them again rather early in the existence of Wekinator, and I taught them not just about machine learning, but I taught them a bit about music programming and a bit about instrument building and a bit about interaction design, even though none of them had done any of those things before. Um, and a few minutes after this photo was taken, there was a knock on the door from the teacher in the classroom next door who said, hey, you guys are making a lot of noise. Um, can I bring my students in and help have them see what's going on? And at that point, the 15 year olds taught the eight year olds from the next door classroom how to do the same thing and how to build instruments um, for you know, making crazy new sounds. So it was pretty easy, that was really gratifying. And that set me on a, a whole new avenue of research, which led me among other places to a recent project called Sound Control. Um, Sound Control was a collaboration with uh, some music therapists and music teachers who wanted to make new musical instruments and new musical interfaces for the kids that they worked with. Um, and they worked with kids with a, a wide variety of disabilities. Um, and they were interested in the potential to connect sensors, cameras, microphones, and so on to different sounds that the kids liked um, and to make instruments and interfaces that the kids could play in ways that were comfortable, in ways that were fun, in ways that allowed them to collaborate with others. Um, and this was a super fun project, not only because I got to make some software that they found useful, but actually, unsurprisingly, when you enable people to become creators, um, they end up doing unexpected and useful things that I never would have thought of as, you know, as a computer programmer. So uh, we have another nine paper from last year about this project in which we talk about some of the things that these therapists and teachers were doing that went far beyond what we thought was going to be useful for them. All right, so just in summary, um, these are a few of the points I've talked about today. Um, talking about how in my own work, I've seen that machine learning can unlock the creative potential of sensors, can allow people to communicate ideas and intentions through data, um, can enable creators to better communicate tacit knowledge and embodied practices to computers, support rapid prototyping and exploration, open up new creative relationships between humans and machines, and enable more people to become creators. So I'm just going to finish up with a, a few slides letting you know what I'm currently working on and thinking about in case we want to talk about any of that during the Q&A. Um, so I'm thinking about how we can make interactive machine learning tools that are well suited to other domains. I've got a project right now called InteractML, where we're trying to make interactive machine learning tools for Unity developers who are making games. 
I'm interested in how we can make other machine learning tools that allow for playfulness, accessibility, exploration, and meaningful interaction with generative and deep machine learning algorithms. I'm interested in how and what we can teach what we should teach creative practitioners about machine learning. Um, unsurprisingly, um, creative machine learning users can benefit from knowing a little bit or a lot about machine learning itself. Um, however, the knowledge and skills that benefit them tend to be different from what computer science students might benefit from. So I have an initial article in this space, but it's something that I remain really interested in. Um, and at the end of the day, I think a lot of my current work is, is motivated by this, by the fact that many people in society, for good reasons, think about machine learning and AI, and um, they think about um, feeling like they don't have any control over where it's going, right? Their experiences might be um, fear that AI is going to take their jobs. Some of that, as I mentioned, you know, might be legitimate, but maybe some of it is not. Um, but even more so, um, I think there's a fear that data, machine learning are being used in ways that are very disempowering, right? They're being used by companies, by governments um, to do things that people don't understand that they haven't necessarily consented to. Um, and that's really different from the ways that people using Wekinator and the other tools I make experience machine learning, um, where it's playful, it's creative, it's accessible. Um, and so, you know, I think there's a lot more to explore here. Um, to ask, you know, how else can we make people's other experiences with data and machine learning less disempowering? Um, can we use these types of techniques to educate people about how machine learning works, for instance? Can we make better tools, not just for creative work, but for other things um, that allow people to make better use of their own data? Um, how ultimately can we maybe give more people a voice in shaping how machine learning is used in society? So with that, I want to thank you very much for uh, coming to my talk today. And I think we've got plenty of time for questions and discussion. Great, thanks a lot, um, Rebecca. I guess we all give you a virtual clapping there. <laughs> um, I wonder if we should, um, perhaps we should stop the screen sharing now. Um, I will okay. get in the panel here as well. Can we see the panel there? Yeah, very nice. Yep. Cool. So, um, as I said, please feel free to add some questions in the um, Q&A part here. There are a couple of questions already and, and we'll get back to those very soon. But I, I'll right. first give the word to Bendikte to, to follow up a little bit uh, from Rebecca's talk. Okay, great. Uh, thanks. So, yeah, I want to first off just thank you for your talk. Um, and say that I've been following your work personally for a few years now and it has also had a big impact on my own work. So thank you for that. Thanks. Um, so one of the things I was curious about, and you mentioned it uh, briefly towards the end here, uh, is if you would want to maybe elaborate on um, sort of the more generative music systems, mm -hmm. um, things like, like OpenAI's jukebox. Um, how do you see their role in live interactive machine learning uh, and in human computer interaction in general? Yeah, I think that's that's a very tough question to answer in part because, um, you know, companies like OpenAI, companies that tend to have, you know, all the data and compute power that's necessary to build these big models have not been looking so much at how to, how to link these algorithms with creators. Um, and it's, it, that doesn't have to be the case. If you unpack um, the the uh, the jukebox project, for instance, they've got you know a bunch of really nice blog posts talking about how they came up with these systems. And as soon as you start reading it, you realize that you know it's not at all an autonomous system. There actually is quite a lot of human involvement in uh, you know getting the lyrics started, curating and cleaning up the lyrics, um, deciding you know what exactly what you know what models to use to generate um, the ultimate audio right it's it's not autonomous at all um, but for the most part the people who are who are doing this are open AI researchers they're not necessarily musicians who have you know another um, maybe creative goal in this process and I think you know absolutely the first step would be to say hey let's let's open this up bring in a bunch of creators and see what kinds of links we can make between them and this existing process we you know maybe these the, the jukebox project isn't designed from the ground up to incorporate human interaction and input um, very gracefully 
but you know, neither were the supervised learning algorithms that I you know, took off the shelf and put into Weconator. So you can exploit, I think, a lot of these algorithms right now when you start really looking at them from the perspective of, you know, what might somebody doing creative work really want to do with this? And I think some best examples, um, not necessarily with, with OpenAI, but in similar um, spaces are, you know, work by people who start exploiting um, deep learning models for their really good um, internal representations of uh, of data, right? As soon as you start thinking about the latent space that might be learned as a, you know, semantically relevant or, or otherwise creatively relevant control space that you might want to navigate, um, then that opens up all sorts of exciting creative possibilities, while also potentially having the benefit that you don't need to always train a new model from scratch in order to do that kind of work. And some of these, you know, latent space um, generation techniques you know, it's not that they're computationally super efficient, but again, you don't need to have thousands and thousands and thousands of pounds of computer to start using them. Some of them work fairly well, even just uh, in the browser. Um, so I, I have a, a postdoc working with me right now, Gabrielle Villasoni from, um, from Montreal, who's a practicing electronic musician, who's doing some really interesting work, building his own latent space representations and visualizations for, uh, for real-time performance with rhythm. So that's, especially if you're interested in rhythm, that might be something that uh, you want to take a look at. Great, awesome. Uh, Alexander, I think you're, you're muted. I'm muted, yes. <laughs> Kira, do you also want to follow up with a question here? Yeah. Because we uh, so, are interested in Rhythm at Rhythmo. <laughs> <laughs> Definitely. So thanks for the talk. Great one. Uh, so I just wanted to, to remark on a couple of things that, uh, that I really agree on. So this, uh, you, you said like the, the artist wanted the kind of the system to be a little bit wild and uncontrollable. And I think that's, that's kind of like an argument that as engineers, we kind of being told that uh, like AI and machine learning, that's kind of not so good because you want the system to be fully analyzable and predictable. Mm -hmm. But here in the creative context, it's really something you can leverage. Uh, so I think that's a great point. And, uh, and also this uh, concept of uh, like having tools is really important, I think, for, for creative people because it's like, so easy to get lost in uh, in some kind of low level framework say if you go straight on tensorflow or uh, some kind of low level programming language you very often get lost in the technical details and it's kind of uh, so much to take care of that you you don't really get to the creative part and that's yeah. a pity yeah. i agree and, also, and yeah. yeah i was gonna say you know one piece of advice that, that i often give to PhD students and, and would give to anybody here is that, you know, if you're doing research that could possibly lead to something that might be interesting for a musician or other creator to use, think about packaging it up, you know, make a simple tutorial, make some good documentation, make a stable version of the software, teach a couple of people how to use it. Um, you, you know, you might really be surprised at where people take it, or at least if not, you may really make a difference in to some people's creative practice. And I think that's a, a great way to have research impact. It's not necessarily always realized you know, or, or, as important um, by traditional academic ven venues, but it's a great way to, to really see your research have a positive uh, impact on the world. Yeah, so if I could follow up on that, because I was going to ask you about uh, kind of something related to the platform or the tool. Mm -hmm. So I think that's, uh, that's very interesting for us at Ritmo to we are like developing, say, live coding tools or uh, robotic platforms and so on, yeah. or software. And, and you have had great success with your Reckonator platform, and now you're developing some new ones that look very interesting, the, the thing for Unity and so on. And so I was wondering, like, kind of, we also want 25,000 users and uh, kind of, do you know, like, what was, what did you do right on the Vecinator and like, what, what have you learned and what do you want to do differently now that you're developing new tools? Do you have some perspectives on that? Yeah, so um, I think that the, the one thing I did right was work with other people who had different ideas from me about what might be interesting to build, who had different ideas from each other 
about what might be interesting who didn't know anything about machine learning to begin with. So, you know, really forced me to make something that was understandable, that was flexible in the right ways, forced me to make reasonably good documentation. Um, and also in the process forced me to think entirely differently about what problems were gonna be interesting to solve, right? And so that was, you know, at the beginning of my PhD, um, that was what really bridged me to the end. You know, I thought I was gonna do an entirely different PhD where I was gonna be focusing on algorithms that were specific for music. And then I realized halfway through this work with composers that, you know what? They didn't need better algorithms, they needed a bunch of other things. Um, and the things that they would do were actually very interesting in themselves to study. So that totally changed the course of my research. Um, but I haven't stopped working closely with users. And every single one of the projects that I mentioned, we've worked very, very closely with professional creators, with amateurs, often with students and kids to really figure out how we, how we make it useful. Because for me, that's not just about well, it's, it's, it makes it easier to get 25,000 users. It's because I know that there's stuff to learn there that nobody knows yet. Thanks. Cool. I see, I guess there are several questions also more from the panel, but uh, we have a few questions now coming in that are quite interesting and relevant to what we have been discussing. And um, first we have one from uh, Alena Klim, who's uh, she's a master's student now in our MCT program here at, uh, at UIO. Uh, and she's asking, how did the Wekinator change over time? Were any features added after you tested it on users or did you stick to the first design? Yeah, um, I could give a whole talk on that. It wouldn't be very interesting, but almost everything changed. I completely rebuilt it from the ground up when I finished my PhD in response to all the feedback that I got. Um, most of the changes that I made hit on those points that I just mentioned. It needed to be simpler, easier for people to get started with, more flexible in the right ways. Um, and I wrote a little bit about some of the changes I made to it in my NIME 2020 paper, if you're interested, but yeah, it, it changed a lot. Well, that's good to know for all students out there, at least that things- um, Yeah, finish things, your PhD uh, <laughs> before you start rebuilding your software. Things, that's another good change. piece of advice. <laughs> yeah. Another good question from another MCT student, um, Rick here. Uh, to what extent did you think reinforcement learning affords other ways of interacting with music than Wekinator? and supervised learning then in general? Yeah, I mean, I think that's that's a great question. I've, I've seen a few projects that use uh, reinforcement learning for, for very interesting musical ends. Um, it's not nearly as explored a space. Um, and I think, you know, one of the challenges with reinforcement learning is that you need this, this sort of feedback or reward signal. And if you stick a human literally in that loop, um, you've got really low bandwidth. Right, so you can't learn things very easily. So one of the, you know, one of the questions is really like, you know, what kinds of musical scenarios might we put a, a reinforcement learning agent into where we can give it a rich enough, you know, feedback signal and a rich enough state space so that it'll do interesting things. But, you know, I'm convinced there's lots of really cool examples out there. It's just a matter of, of again, taking this infrastructure of machine learning and saying, you know, what are matches to, to musical or other creative problems? And also critically, you know, what are the rules of reinforcement learning that we might just completely disregard or break to make it do something interesting in a musical space? Mm -hmm. Could I, could I shoot in a question there? Uh, because uh, not everyone here uh, in this space here are, are, are ex experts in, in computer science and machine learning or perhaps the opposite really. Um, so, so here at Ritmo, we are uh, talking quite a lot about evolutionary computing and, and bio-inspired systems, et cetera. And then now you're mentioning reinforcement learning and, and Wekinator. Would it be possible for you, Rebecca, or perhaps also Kira could help to, to very quickly and, and easily kind of explain some of these differences? Sure, I'll, I'll uh, give my quickest possible explanation and maybe Kira can jump in with anything that you think is missing for this audience. So um, Wekinator is supervised learning and that's really just you know, the, the, the examples that I showed you, you give, uh, your goal is to build a model that takes input values and produces outputs. Um, and it learns that from a set of example inputs with example outputs. So a set of you know, example gestures paired with sounds. That'll build you a model that sees new gestures gives you new sounds. Um, reinforcement learning is a different style of machine learning where your goal is not to just learn a function that looks at an input and gives you an output, but it's actually, um, this is 
often formulated as, you know, imagine you have uh, an agent, a, a virtual intelligence that, you know, lives in some kind of space, right? So it can sense things about the world around it, and it can make decisions about what to do in that space. Does it want to move in that space? Does it want to take a different action? And then through moving around and doing stuff in this space, it either gets rewards, right? It gets a virtual piece of candy, or it gets punishments, it virtually dies, or, you know, other formulations of that. But through experience with this world, learns what actions um, it should take that are good and what actions it maybe should avoid. Um, and of course, there's, there's lots of different applications of this. We've seen, you know, really um, powerful, exciting advances in reinforcement learning. Um, the classic example that you might be familiar with is, is training agents to play video games. Um, and early work coming out of DeepMind was very much um, of this flavor. But you could put this into other contexts and say, well, it's not literally about an agent moving through a space, but in music, it could be about, hey, I observe what the music, what music is being made by people around me, and I'm going to decide how to respond. What rhythms do I play? What notes do I play? Uh, when do I play? Um, and then I get a reward in that, you know, people mimic me or people, you know, everybody claps or everybody leaves the room or whatever. Mm. And you want to add anything to that, Kira? Uh, yeah, uh, I think that was good explanations. Uh, but uh, coming then to the evolutionary or the, the kind of the search uh, uh, approaches, uh, I guess you could say that those are more, um, they're not so focused on the interactions at the given moment. They're more about kind of creating something 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 new that's uh, that's uh, specified like you have this kind of function you're a kind of description that tells if a solution is is a good good one or not or how good it is so it ha has less kind of uh, restrictions in in the in the this uh, say search process and that uh, that may open for up for even more say like um, creative or, or new new solutions but it, it's uh, as the search technique, it requires more computation. It's kind of less powerful in exploiting the data you give to it. But it's it's looked uh, upon as a more like um, exploratory uh, search process. Yeah. One thing that I would also add is, you know, again, a lot of my talk today focused on my research, which is with supervised learning, but a lot of other machine learning and and also evolutionary algorithms approaches because they work with data you can think of in you know as having some of the same potential benefits right if you if you're building a computer system that you know in part learns or adapts to examples from the world or to other types of information like you know you giving it rewards um, or you know its ob observations of how you react to it um, then you're also potentially seeing many of the same benefits as supervised learning in, in bypassing coding in working from data that might be a very natural way for people to communicate. Cool. I see there are many questions coming in here now. Mm -hmm. uh, and we'll try to get to, to, to okay. all of them. Uh, and perhaps also Rebecca would like to, to reply to some of them in, in writing afterwards if you don't get, get through them. But I just wanted to, to ask yeah. also Bendicte because I know that Bendicte is, is working on uh, motion capture, dancing and music, which is a fairly high dimensional, you could say, on yeah, both sides yeah. uh, thing. And, and is interested also in the creativity aspects of this. And, and Bendicte, do you want to say just a little bit more about uh, your, your approach to this and how it it fits with Rebecca's. Yeah, sure. Um, yeah, so so for for me, yes, obviously working with movement, the kids uh, and and human movement. So the data is often messy. It's often noisy, um, and. Uh, sort of back to what we uh, mentioned earlier with sort of. Um, since what I am doing is sort of, it is generative machine learning. So we are so like trying to produce something, showing the model a ton of data and then trying to get it to produce something which is similar to, but not the same as what it has learned from all the data. And so I'm, I am constantly sort of looking for ways to think about this in terms of computational creativity, sort of how how should I best uh, choose a model to, to do this task? And so, of course, yeah, reinforcement learning uh, comes up a lot uh, as an option. I also like what you mentioned about sort of um, spending some time really looking at 
the latent space and what is actually being learned by the model and how I can sort of explore that more directly than just mm -hmm. through sort of a generative process. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, um, I also had a, a question which is kind of a little bit on the side of this, but I really wanted to know because many of us listening here today, um, we're lucky enough to have um, a fair amount of overlap between our creative practices and our research. Uh, and I know you're a musician yourself. And I was, I was curious because uh, even though we might be able to, to do a little bit of both in our everyday, that can still be, have some, some, some be a bit complicated at times, knowing mm -hmm. sort of when to do what. And so yes. I was curious how you, how you deal with this in your own work. <laughs> That's a great question. I mean, I, I certainly don't have the perfect solution. I think, you know, as as a reader now, I don't get to make music as much as I'd like to. I also don't get to program nearly as much as I'd like to. I would be so happy if I could, you know, have more time making music and and making software, but instead I, you know, get to work with other people who are mainly doing that and I kind of, you know, tell them what to do or I, you know, which is less fun. Um, but I certainly, you know, I feel like having, having the background in music certainly, you know, ended up influencing my research in really productive ways. Um, number one, at the beginning, um, I think like many people, a lot of my ideas were inspired by what I wanted to do myself. Um, but that was not the most productive way to to launch a research trajectory, right? I think like like many people, my ideas are my own. Many of them are just not generalizable. Nobody cares. Um, but it, you know, having a background in music and a love for music gave me a shared vocabulary. When I went to work with other musicians, it gave me a shared set of values. Um, it allowed me to understand sort of, you know, their goals in their practice, um, what they found interesting and, and to, you know, to also, I think, be more receptive when their goals really didn't align with mine, right? Mm -hmm. I think that's a hard thing to learn as a researcher, but you have to be open to that if you're really going to make something um, that's useful for people. And so I think having having that ability to to understand and and hear more clearly where they were coming from was very valuable for me at the beginning um, of this work. Another thing I would say that the place where my own practice has come into my research most clearly is you know, if you if you work in tech, uh, you might often hear a term called dog fooding, which is this principle that you you eat your own dog food, which means, you, if you're going to build a new technology, you should use it first and work out the really bad bugs before you waste anybody else's time. Um, and so I definitely, I do dog fooding with a lot of the software that I make. You know, if I start using, if I'm going to use it in a performance, you know, I'm probably going to find a large chunk of the bugs that are there. And then at least I know that somebody else doesn't have to deal with that. Um, so that's, you know, fun for me because I get to, you know, do some of my creative work and, and, and say that it's part of my, my real job, but also I'm, I'm saving someone else from like really <laughs> egregious mistakes. <laughs> yeah, not good. Cool, let's take another one from the Q&A session. There's also a couple of more technical ones that probably are easier to, to answer in text uh, afterwards with okay. some links, I guess. But uh, let's take one from Anna Danielson about, uh, she, she asks, I find it very fascinating that the somewhat wild and controllable character of sounds made by ML techniques come forward as more human than sound, sounds generated by techniques where humans are more in control of the output. Any thoughts on, on that? I guess it's that creativity side we have been talking about. Yeah, um, I mean, I'll, I'll say a couple things. I think, you know, it's, it's important to note that most of the people, including Letitia, who, who talked about the wildness being desirable, most of the people I've, I've talked to in depth about their work with Wekinator don't, don't envision Wekinator um, as a sort of humanoid or intelligent entity that they're collaborating with. Um, it's also, you know, it's substantially different from, from writing a piece of software that you control yourself. It's, it's some other kind of thing, but it's not one of those two. Um, so it's not necessarily, I think, that it's 
you know, acting in a more human way, um, but maybe that it you know, gives behaviors and, and supports processes that feel more natural um, in some ways. And I think there's, there's two things that I can, uh, that I would attribute this to for starters. Number one is, um, you know, again, in contrast to, um, to coding, oftentimes, you know, when you're using this type of machine learning and you get a surprising behavior, that behavior is not that you have a bug. It's not that you have a segmentation fault. You, the, the surprise is that you get some kind of relevant behavior, right? A new sound that you weren't expecting. So the surprises are still often in the, the relevant domain, um, which, you know, sometimes is still really annoying and you don't want it, but sometimes can, you know, lead to serendipity in ways that coding errors just can't. Um, another, you know, very music specific phenomenon that I think is at play here um, is something that's been studied a little bit um, by Marcello Wanderly, who Alexander knows well, and, and um, Andy Hunt, um, where they've looked at um, uh, the importance of uh, what they call many-to-many -many mappings, where you have many aspects of, um, say, physical movement of a performer controlling many aspects of the sound synthesis. And that's something that is also, that's just super hard to make um, as a programmer. Um, but it turns out that many-to-many -many mappings can often feel literally more natural, can be easier to learn, can be more musically satisfying to interact with for you know, a variety of reasons, maybe not all of which we understand. But machine learning, you know, building a mapping where you have 20 inputs and 20 outputs is just as fast and easy conceptually as building mapping where you have one input and one output because the process is the same, there's no more work. Um, and so, um, you're, you're able to build these kinds of mappings that can be more likely to be musically satisfying, as well as, you know, having that process of, of building them um, be something that feels sort of creatively relevant. Cool. I see that we are actually running out of time here, uh, unless there are some really final questions or comments from Kira and Benedicta here. No, I could just uh, sort of jump in on that. Uh question from from on that just a comment because I, I definitely see this as well in in my own work with with movement about uh, as soon as things sort of go awry people find that just in, just intrinsically as an interesting thing and uh, we we sort of uh, I think it sort of also goes back to, to Rebecca's definition of, of machine learning and, and as such uh, as sort of just a, a pattern finding thing like it finds patterns and we obviously as humans do this as well so we're like quick to see that in other things and appreciate it even though it's might be surprising and maybe even more so when it's surprising but like you saw a pattern there what's that uh and we find that very interesting so yeah i thought that was a really cool question or, or point mm -hmm. from on that yeah Cool. I think we need to close there. Thanks a lot for, for joining us today. Thanks a lot to Rebecca for, uh, for presenting and talking. Thanks a lot to Kira and Benedicte for sitting on the panel. Uh, there are a few open questions. Let's try to get uh, to them in writing. Uh, so go sure. back to the web page and, and um, I'm sure that, uh, that Rebecca will tell you about her plans for, for, for Vecinator in the future. Uh, but thanks for coming today. Um, and also, if you're interested in Rhythm Activities, then, then um, sign up on the, uh, to the mailing list so that you will get more information. Uh, about what we're doing here. Uh, so thanks for today. Goodbye. Thanks for having me. Thanks, everybody.